So just like circular trigonometry, the six hyperbolic functions have inverses. So we could talk about the inverse of hyperbolic sine, which we would call arc cinch. We can talk about the inverse of hyperbolic cosine, which would be arc cosh. And so we have like hyperbolic arc tangent, hyperbolic arc cotangent, hyperbolic arc secant, and hyperbolic arc cosecant. So you have inverses of each and every one of these. Now you'll recall that cinch we've defined earlier using the formula e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2. So we defined hyperbolic sine using the natural exponential. It maybe comes as no surprise then that the inverse of hyperbolic sine can be described using logarithms. And I want to describe to you exactly how one can see that. Let's carry this on below that if we have our function, if cinch inverse of x is equal to y, by the inverse function property, this tells us that x is equal to cinch of y, which if we apply the definition, we're going to get e to the y minus e to the negative y all over 2. And then we can try to solve for x in this situation, excuse me, solve for y in this situation. Times both sides by 2, we get 2x equals e to the y minus e to the negative y. Now we're going to move everything to one side of the equation. So we're just going to subtract the 2x from both sides. And we end up with the equation that e to the y minus 2x minus e to the negative y is equal to 0. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides of this equation by e to the y. So we do it to the left-hand side, and we're going to do it to the right-hand side as well. This is the advantage of moving the right-hand side equal to 0. If you times by 0, nothing happens. So distribute this e to the y through we're going to end up with an e to the 2y, or e to the y squared, if you want to think of it that way. You're going to get a negative 2x e to the y, and then e to the y times e to the negative y is just going to give you a 1, so you get negative 1. That's equal to 0. So with this in mind, we can treat the left-hand side as a quadratic expression. It's a quadratic-like equation, uh, which instead of the usual variable x, we're going to have this e to the e to the y right here. And so applying the quadratic equation, we get that e to the y is equal to, well, the coefficients here, you're going to get that a equals 1, b equals negative 2x, and c equals negative 1 for the quadratic formula. So you get a negative b, which will be 2x, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is a 4x squared. You get a negative 4ac. Well, a is just 1, and c is just negative 1, so we're going to get a plus 4 right there. And this all sits over a 2a, so we just get 2 times 1, so just a 2 right there. Trying to simplify this thing, uh, notice we can factor out a 4, leaving behind x squared plus 1, for which then the square root of 4 is a 2, so we get 2x plus or minus 2 times the square root of x squared plus 1 all over 2. You can factor the 2 out from the numerator, and this will cancel out with the 2 in the denominator, thus simplifying to give us x plus or minus the square root of x squared plus 1, which is equal to e to the y. Well, you can see here that if you take the negative sign, so we're, there's sort of two possibilities that have to be considered here. You have e to the y is equal to x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. And then there's the other situation. We have e to the y is equal to x minus the square root of x squared minus 1. Well, notice that if you take, if you take the square root of x squared, that's just going to give you an x. So x minus x is going to give you 0. An exponential function can't equal 0. Well, x squared plus 1 is a little bit bigger than x squared, which means the square root of x squared plus 1 is a little bit bigger than x. So this actually would be a negative number, which exponentials can't be negative. So that possibility doesn't happen. Turns out this is the possibility we have to proceed with. For which then, to solve for y, if you take the natural log of both sides, you will end up with y equals the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1, like so. Which, coming back up to the top, that's exactly the formula we had for arc cinch right here. Now, I'm not going to go through this calculation for the other five inverse hyperbolic functions, but we can see that the inverse of cosh is going to look similar. It's going to be the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared minus 1. Uh, the, the hyperbolic arc tangent will be 1 half the natural log of 1 plus x over 1 minus x. Very similar is the formula of inverse hyperbolic cotangent, which is 1 half the natural log of x plus 1 over x minus 1. 
The inverse of hyperbolic secant will be the natural log of one plus the square root of one minus x squared over x. And then the inverse of hyperbolic cosecant will be the natural log of one plus the square root of one plus x squared all over x. Now it's also important to mention that there are some domain restrictions in play here that uh, arc cinch will be defined for all real numbers, but the other functions will have restrictions to their domains. So arc cosh is only defined for uh, values of x that are greater than or equal to one. Um, arc hyperbolic arc tangent is only defined for x is between negative one and one. Uh, arc cotangent hyperbolic is only defined for the absolute value of x is greater than one, which is just a fancy way of saying that x is less than negative one or x is greater than one. It turns out that hyperbolic arc secant is gonna be, x has to be between zero and one where one is included. And arc cosecant hyperbolic is defined for all real numbers except for zero. This is not something necessarily that's easy to memorize by all means, but if we explore the graphs of these functions for a second, we can ex understand exactly why we have these restrictions on their domains. Let's briefly discuss the graphs of the inverse hyperbolic functions. You can see the graph of cinch illustrated to you in orange on the screen right now. This graph is in fact a one-to-one -one function. As you look at any horizontal lines, it'll intersect the graph at exactly one location. So since the function is one-to-one, -one, uh, we can invert it and if you reflect it across the diagonal line, y equals x, which is about right here on the screen, you get a graph that looks like this, illustrated here in blue. You'll notice that these functions are in fact mirror images of each other or reflected across that diagonal line y equals x. Well, some things that we can say. Well, since the domain and range of cinch are all real numbers, we see that the domain and range of arc cinch are also all real numbers, although there is an inverse relationship going on here. As x approaches infinity, arc cinch will go towards infinity, and as x approaches negative infinity, arc cinch will also approach negative infinity. What about the inverse of cosh? Well, that one's a little bit more tricky uh, because cosh itself is not a one-to-one -one function. You can see that horizontal lines will intersect the graph in multiple locations like you see this right here. As such, in order to invert it, we have to restrict its domain. This is something we commonly do with the trig functions like sine and cosine. So if we turn that on for a second, notice that if we were just to take the right half of the cosh function, that will retain the entire range one to infinity, but there's no more duplications. The duplications came from the left side of the graph, right? When we have things over here having the same y coordinate as what's on the right hand side. So we have to restrict the domain of cosh to be zero to infinity. And then in that situation, the graph is invertible, in which case the inverse of cosh, that is arc cosh, will look like this blue curve right here. It, cosh kind of looks like a square root, or excuse me, it looks like kind of like an even monomial, like a parabola. And so its inverse kind of looks like a square root, uh, although instead of a uh, radical growth, this one will be much more like a logarithmic growth. It's very slow growing, but looks looks kind of like a square root, again, with that logarithmic growth right there. Because of the restrictions we had to place on it, the domain of cosh inverse will be from zero, excuse me, from one to infinity, and the range will will be from zero to infinity as well. We can see that as x approaches infinity, arc cosh will approach infinity very, very slowly, like logarithmically slow. And as you approach x equals one from the right, uh, you'll be approaching y equals zero from above. Now consider the graph of hyperbolic tangent. You'll recall that this graph had some horizontal asymptotes at one and negative one. So while the domain is all real numbers for hyperbolic tangent, its range is from negative one to one, where one and negative one are not included in that. This is a one-to-one -one function, so we can invert it. And when we do so, we get this graph here in bluish green, which is arc tangent, the hyperbolic arc tangent which again, it looks like the reflection uh, across the diagonal line y equals x. This function, it looks kind of like it's just an odd monomial, but when you zoom out, you see that there's some asymptotes going on here. These are in fact vertical asymptotes. The vertical asymptotes will coincide with x equals one and x equals negative one. Because when you take a function and switch to its inverse, horizontal asymptotes will turn into vertical asymptotes. So our function of hyperbolic arctangent, its domain will be from negative one to one. 
where negative one and one are not included in the domain, but its range is gonna be all real numbers. Consider now our bump function, that is hyperbolic secant. This function, much like cosh, which we can see right there, right? These functions are reciprocals of each other. These functions, neither of these functions, cosh or hyperbolic secant, these are not one-to-one -one functions. So if we want to have an, inver an inverse of hyperbolic secant, we have to restrict its domain. So considering that here, much like Cauch, the there's a duplicity of y coordinates. If we get rid of the left hand side of the graph, we actually get something that's now one to one and hence invertible. So we're going to reflect that across the line y equals x, and we get this blue function right here, which is the graph of hyperbolic arc secant. Okay. Well, hyper or the hyperbolic secant had a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis. When you invert this. This shows us that hyperbolic arc secant will also get a asymptote, but it'll be a vertical asymptote at the y-axis we see right here. And so because of this restriction, we see that the domain of hyperbolic arc, uh, hyperbolic arc secant is gonna be from zero to one, where one is included because we do have an x-intercept right here. Zero is not included in the domain because of the vertical asymptote. But then the range of hyperbolic arc secant will be from zero all the way up to infinity. As x approaches zero from the right, hyperbolic arc secant will go towards infinity. And as we approach one from the left, hyperbolic arc secant will approach zero from above. You can now see on the screen illustrated in orange, the graph of hyperbolic cosecant. Uh, it's the reciprocal of cinch, right? This function does have a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis. It has a vertical asymptote at the y-axis as well. This function is one-to-one. -one. I mean, cinch was one-to-one -one and so is hyperbolic cosecant. As such, we can invert it and we get this blue curve, which looks very, very similar to hyperbolic cosecant. They're not the same one. Arc uh, cosecant is a little bit different. Um, they will have the same asymptotes though. Hyperbolic arc cosecant, it'll, as X approaches infinity, it'll approach zero from above. As x approaches negative infinity, it'll approach zero from below. As x approaches zero from the right, uh, arc cosecant will go to a negative infinity, the hyperbolic one will. And as x approaches zero from the left, we see that hyperbolic arc cosecant will approach zero from the left. Last but not least is the hyperbolic cotangent, whose graph you can see on orange on the screen right now. Uh, this function is one-to-one. -one. Uh, it's the reciprocal of hyperbolic tangent. Uh, these functions are one-to-one, -one, so they are invertible. The inverse is going to be hyperbolic arc cotangent, which you see there in the bluish green on the screen. We should point out that the hyperbolic cotangent function does have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. As such, its inverse will have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, aka the x-axis. Likewise, the hyperbolic cotangent function, it has horizontal asymptotes at y1 and y equals negative one. As a consequence, the arc cotangent function, the hyperbolic variant, will have vertical asymptotes at x equals one and x equals negative one. So now look at that here on the screen. So as x approaches infinity, arc cotangent hyperbolic will approach zero from above. As x approaches negative infinity, the function will approach zero from below. As x approaches uh, one from the right, hyperbolic arc cotangent will approach infinity. As x approaches negative one from the left, this function will approach negative infinity. And then between one and negative one is no man's land. There's nothing that's outside the domain of our function here. So the domain of this function will be It'll be x is less than negative one, strictly less than, or x is greater than negative one, which we can abbreviate that as the absolute value of x needs to be greater than one. That's the domain of this function. The range of this function will then be all real numbers except for zero because of the horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, the x-axis.